Come on, somebody. Come on, let's make some noise for Jesus today. Come on, for Jesus Christ. Come on. Hey, can we, can we, um, Cody, you look amazing. I just want you to know that. You look, thank you, bro. Uh, let's just sing that together. Just, just let's raise our voices. Let's just do the guitar. And let's sing that again together. All hell, King Jesus. Just, just that one part again. Come on. If you're comfortable, would you raise your hands? Jesus. If you would raise your hand, just say, I surrender to you, Jesus. I surrender to you, God. Come on, somebody say hallelujah. It is the greatest form of praise that you can say out of your mouth. Come on, say hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hey, we want to say welcome to the church. We are so thankful that you're here. Come on, you look amazing. Look at somebody tell them you look amazing today. Amen. You look amazing today. You look amazing today. You guys look so great today. We're so thankful that you chose to worship here at the church Lawton with us. You could be anywhere in the world or in Lawton, America, but you woke up today and you said, I'm going to go to the church and I'm going to worship Jesus because his name is Jesus. He created you. You were created on purpose for a purpose. Each and every one of you, if you're still alive, and you are because you're here, He's still talking to you. He's speaking to you. He created you with a purpose. And our hope is that here at the church lot, and we get to help you discover your purpose. That's one of our values here is that you discover your purpose because you were created for a God-given purpose, not a worldly purpose, but a God-given purpose. And if you're here today and you don't have a church that you call your church home, or maybe you're from the army or you're in the military and you're like, you know, I had a, a church home way back where I was stationed last time, but I don't have one now. We want to say welcome home. Can we welcome them home? You don't have to look anymore. You have found it. We are so glad you're here. We can't wait to know each and every one of you. And it is our honor to host you guys this Easter. Well, thank you so much. I just wanted her uh, to come up here and just greet y'all on this Easter Sunday. Come on, somebody. So I'm going to have you just stand just for a moment, and I'm going to read a scripture, but, but again, we want to say we're so glad that you're with us, and if this is your first time, um, like she said, welcome home. Come on, your family already. Can I get a good amen? And you picked a good Sunday to be here because we are in part two of a collection that we've titled Built for This. Come on, everybody say Built for This. Come on, say it with your chest, Built for This. I don't know what kind of church you come from, but we're a shouting church. Can I get an Amen. Come on. Hey, I'm going to say something. We're going to practice. Just make sure we're ready to go Easter Sunday. I'm going to say preach that, and then you say preach that. So we're going to try it. Preach that. Preach that. Say, that's good. Yes. Say, you on it now? Yes. Say, come on, Jesus. Yes. Say, preach it, brown boy. Yes. Doctor, you always, I'm, I'm praying one of, these, one of these years you get saved in Jesus' name. No, hey, it's so good to see you guys. I want to read this. I just want to make sure that you guys know we shout a little bit. Come on, it's okay to have fun in church. Come on, I grew up in some churches. I don't even know if Jesus was there. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> but I just, I believe that church should be enjoyed and not endured. Come on, we get to raise up the name of, the name of all names, Jesus Christ. And so we should enjoy these moments where we gather and we learn about the King of Kings. And, but we're in a, a collection we kicked off last week, a collection of talks titled Built for This. And I want you to know today is not a lecture of rules and regulations, but rather an invitation into the plan that God has for you. It was never my wife and I, it was never our dream to fill rooms with people, but rather to fill people with Jesus. Create a place and a space where people could hear the message of Jesus. And so it's an invitation into the plan that God has for you. And my prayer is not that today be a moment of 
well, I went to church this Easter, but rather a moment marker that impacts your life forever. Not because of a sermon we say or songs we sing, but because the God of the universe comes down and meets us today. That he meets you right where you're at. Because what I know is I don't know what you're going through. I don't know every problem and every situation, every struggle, come on, every tear that you cry. But what I do know is there is a God that does. And there is a God that loves you. I don't know if you've ever heard that before, but I want you to know he loves you. Come on, God is for you and not against you. Come on, greater is he that is in me than he that is in all the world. Come on, somebody, you need to hear this today. You are more than a conqueror through Christ Jesus. Come on, somebody. You have an encounter with the God of the universe. And, you know, I don't intend to preach long, but come on, somebody, I intend to preach strong. Because today is the day we get to raise up the name of Jesus Christ. Come on, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the one who was and is and is to come. Come on, does anybody today believe that Jesus Christ is risen? Come on. And so I'm going to read this scripture. And the church I grew up in, we used to stand for the reading of the scripture. And so there's special moments that I love to do this. I just, I'm a nostalgic kind of person. I love like, like the history of things. And, and y'all, I've actually thought I just should just do it every Sunday in Jesus name. Come on, somebody. But Luke uh, 24, if you have your Bibles. And I just want to tell you, we're going to read this scripture. And then um, you guys can have a seat. And we're going to talk about a few thoughts. And then you can go hunt Easter eggs and eat jelly beans until you end up in a sugar coma. Come on. Um, is there any parental candy thieves in the room? Come on, you steal your kids' candy out of the buckets? I love Easter because I get to eat all their candy. You know what I'm saying? Come on, I brought them into the world. I can eat their candy and take them out. You know what I'm saying? Hey, parents, this is, this is the rule. If you're, if you're not a parent yet, here you go. This is what you tell them. You tell them this. You say, I am checking to see if this is poison. Every time it works. But <laughs> my uh, five-year-old last night, she turned it on me, okay? Um, they, were, they were stuffing some eggs. It was like almost 11 o'clock, and my five-year-old's like, Daddy, can I have a piece of candy? I'm like, go ahead, baby girl. You can have a piece of candy. And then she comes up, and she's got this red Jolly Rancher in her mouth, and she says, Daddy, it's not poison. <laughs> I said, okay, baby girl. Luke 24, if you have your Bibles, it just reads like this. It says, but very early on a Sunday morning, the women went to the tomb taking the spices they had prepared. They found that the stone had been rolled from the entrance. So they went in, but they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And as they stood there puzzled, two men suddenly appeared to them clothed in dazzling robes. The women were terrified and they bowed their faces to the ground and the men asked them, listen to this, why are you looking among the dead for somebody who's alive. Why are you looking among the dead for someone who is alive? He is not here. He is risen. Come on, somebody. He is risen. And I thought about a title for today's talk. And um, in the Synoptic Gospel of Matthew, and that just means it's the same story but told by one of the other disciples. And Matthew says this in this account, the women come to the tomb to look for Jesus. And when they get there, um, they find that he's not there. And so the angel tells them, I know what you're looking for. Jesus, for he is not here. He is risen. So here's your title today. It's simply this. I know what you're looking for. God, we thank you for your incorruptible word. We thank you for the seed that you've given our souls in your words, God. I pray that every word that comes from my mouth, God, that it would fall on deaf ears. But every word from your heart, God, that you would speak it loud and clear to those that need to hear it, God. God, we feel your presence in this moment. And God, you know what every single person in this room came in needing. God, I ask that you would meet them right where they're at. And do what only you can do in Jesus' mighty name. Come on, everybody said? Come on, church. Everyone said amen. 
Come on, if you love Jesus, make some noise in this place. You guys can have a seat. Tell somebody they look amazing today. Come on, if you came with your spouse, you better be telling them they look amazing. You know what I'm saying? Um, no, y'all look so good. Easter Sunday. I want y'all to know I've already ripped a pair of pants. <laughs> no, I had some nice slacks on. You know what I mean? I had some dress pants on. Y'all was stretching because you never know. You know, sometimes I get, it gets wild. And so I was stretching and I ripped my pants in my office. Thank God I had an extra pair. Come on, somebody. I was thinking, I'll be okay. I'm like, no, I won't. No, I won't. <laughs> I'll put some jeans on. Thank God. God knew I was going to rip them pants. Come on, somebody. <laughs> um, I thought about just doing something kind of neat. If uh, I didn't do this first experience, so that means you're, you're special, okay? Um, if you transitioned with us at Word Alive, would you just stand to your feet? Whenever my wife and I, we took over uh, the church, would you guys just stand up if anyone that was here? What I want you all to do is for those that were with us, I want you all just to look around at what God has done in just a few years. And I want to say thank you all, not for believing in Sheridan and I, but for believing and trusting in God. For we have seen hundreds of people come to know Jesus already. We have given away hundreds of thousands of dollars into different things, into this community, into people we've helped plant dozens and dozens of churches across the world in a few years and I want to say thank y'all thank y'all so much for believing in what God is doing and I want y'all to know come on the best is yet to come can I get a good amen it's just uh it's just kind of a special moment that we can gather like this and and we can see dozens of people give their life to Jesus and and um building anything is not easy especially especially a church and there's a lot of hard moments, there's a lot of hard things, there's a lot of sacrifice that um, all of us have made that, that many people, they just don't know. And, and I just want to give God all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise, Jesus Christ. Come on, somebody. Um, well, I do have a question in relation to the text today. And the question is this, and you can raise your hand. We're a participating church. Can I get a good amen? Who in the room has ever lost anything? Come on, raise your hand. If you've ever lost anything, if you ain't raising your hand, you lost your mind. You're lying, okay? Welcome to the Lost Club, okay? No, no, um, y'all, if, 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 if I could have chosen my Indian name, it would have been this, man who loses stuff. Y'all, lo I've lost so much stuff in my life. I lost, I've lost more keys than I can count. I've lost phones and I've lost wallets. Come on, anybody ever lost any cash? Anybody lose some today? Because I'm praying I find it in Jesus' name. You know what I'm saying? No, no, I've lost so much stuff, but, but the most important thing that I've ever lost, and I'm really embarrassed to admit it, but it's for the good of the gospel, so I'm going to share it today. Um, but the most, most embarrassing thing I've lost is I lost my daughter, Ava. Now, I want to tell you, she's here now, okay, so it's good. You can take a deep breath. We know where she's at now. But no, 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 Ava, um, she was about six years old. She just started going to school. She's riding the school bus. And so my mom is actually going to go pick her up. And my mom gets to the bus stop by my house. And um, everyone gets off the school bus, but Ava doesn't get off. And so my mom asked the other kids, she said, hey, did y'all see Ava on the bus? And they're like, no, Ava didn't get on the bus today. And so anyway, she calls my wife Sheridan and she says, hey, um, Ava never got on the school bus. And Sheridan's like, what are you talking about? She never, never got, on, got off the school bus. So Sheridan, she starts panicking. So she calls the school. And the school's like, no, we put her in the bus line. And we put her on the bus. And so then they called the school bus driver. And the school bus driver's like, um, I really don't remember if she got on the bus or not. So then Sheridan calls me, and Sheridan's like, hey, we don't know where Ava's at. And I'm like, what do you mean? She wasn't at the bus stop. Like, what are you talking about? Y'all, I am panicked. I was at work at the time. I was a police officer here in the city, and now I'm looking. Y'all, I'm driving 100 miles an hour, I am, and I have no idea where I'm going. I am panicked. I'm freaking out, y'all. I'm thinking the worst. I'm like, she's in somebody's trunk. She's on her way to Mexico. Y'all, I'm like, if it's been at least 30 minutes since we realized she's been missing. And if they drive anything like my wife, they're already in El Paso. You know what I'm saying? I am, I am freaked out. I'm panicked. I am like, I have no idea. For a couple minutes, we have no idea where our daughter was. She's lost. And so, so then um, all of a sudden, Ava calls her mom from her papa's phone. And she's like, hi, mom. 
And she's like, what do you mean, hi, mom? Ava, where are you at? And she's like, well, I, I got off the school bus stop at Papa's office because this six-year-old going on 16 thought she would just do what she wanted. Y'all, I was completely like panicked. I'm freaking out. I'm like, where's my daughter? Where'd she go? Where's she at? And then we, then we find her. And I thought about this like traumatic event and uh, last week, it was literally last week, I've, I've done this several times, but I've literally Googled, is it legal to put a GPS tracker in your kid? I'm talking about like in the back of the arm, the thigh, come on, just a little shot. They wouldn't even feel it, you know, like a GPS dog tracker, you know what I'm saying? Come on, don't look at me like that, they're my kids. I could put a GPS tracker in them if I want to. I'll tell you how it goes. But I was thinking, have you ever been so overwhelmed, panicked, looking for something, but you looked in all the wrong places? Because inside of each and every single one of us in the room, we are all desperately looking for something. And I'm not talking about material things, but rather something much deeper than that. The thing in which your soul longs for. It's home in God. And though you've never put that into language, you know what I say is true. All of us are searching. All of us are looking. And so it brings us to this text this morning, Luke 24. The setting is it's been three days since Jesus was put and nailed to a cross. And then Jesus is, he dies there on the cross and then he's put into a grave. And on the third day, these women, they come to the tomb in hopes looking for Jesus. And I was thinking, can you imagine like the great emotion that these women would have been experiencing? The characters here, you have Mary, the mother of Jesus. You have Mary Magdalene, who Jesus had set free of demonic possession. And so she, she cared greatly for Jesus. And then you have another lady named Joanna. And Joanna was a follower of Jesus and a supporter of his ministry. These women, they, they care about Jesus so much that they go there to anoint his body with spices. And I was thinking, where are the rest of the disciples? Where are the ones that followed him and saw him do miracles and do great things? The other disciples, they're actually all in hiding because they're afraid of facing the same fate of Jesus. But you have some courageous women. Some women that say, I don't care what happens to us. We're going to go see Jesus. They go looking to find him even if he's dead. And so have you ever, like, hoped for something and you didn't find it? Have you ever hoped for, I hope this thing is going to happen. I hoped like I was going to be finally free of this addiction after I said yes to Jesus. I thought when I was going to get baptized, I thought I was going to be free of this mindset and this anxiety and this stress. And I thought I was going to be free of the depression. I, I had hoped whenever I was going to find fulfillment whenever I married you. I had hoped uh, I could carry a child full term and I didn't have to face the disappointment of losing another one. I had hoped the business was going to succeed this time. I, I hoped the lights weren't going to get cut off again. I, I had hoped that the doctor's diagnosis was wrong, but, but I had hoped. And at the end of the hope, what happens when, when you find that nothing is there? What do you do when you feel like all hope is lost? When what you were hoping for is gone. And so these women, they, they arrive at the tomb. And what they find is Jesus is not there. Thus the angel says, why are you looking among the dead for the living? And this is what I really want to pull out of the text in the few moments that we ha have is this. Is, is, isn't this what we do? Like we go to... Dead places looking for life? Like from the moment we take our first breath and we come out of the womb kicking and screaming, perhaps what happens, it is the first moment that we take a breath on this side of earth and, and we finally realize that we are forever separated from our creator. And so what happens is we quickly get this learned behavior of I cry, I get fed. I scream, I get held. You learn a pattern of doing something to satisfy the search. To numb the pain, even if but for a moment. 
And I think about Jesus' words. Jesus said, man shall not live on bread alone. Because he knew that this separation from God could never be satisfied with the things of this world. Thus we grow, we simply learn to look for things that simply temporarily satisfy the search of the soul. What happens is too much of the time we get lost in the looking and maybe I can satisfy the search at, at the bottom of a bottle. And I know it's not good for me, but, 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 but at the bottom of a bottle, it numbs the pain. Maybe it's, 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 I can numb it and I can just like look for it and, and going from this person to that person, even if they abuse me, because I would rather feel pain than nothing at all. Come on, does that feel like anybody in the room today? I would rather you, you abuse me than be alone. I would rather feel this thing. I would rather go back to this addiction. I would rather turn back to this person. I would rather put myself in this destructive pattern. I would, I would rather do this. I would rather go there. I would rather take the pill. I would rather keep doing the drugs. I would rather keep being with this person. I would rather try to find it in him or her or her or him. I'm just looking to numb the pain and satisfy the search. I don't know how I'm going to going to finally feel fulfilled. I don't know. I'm just looking and looking like like if I just find a man, if I just find a man like six, two and good hair. Come on. I don't even care. Even if he still lives with his mama, girl. Come on, six, two and good hair ain't going to pay the bills. Come on, somebody. Come on. You're going to be eating a lot of bread hills in Jesus name. <laughs> I'm just, I'm looking for it in the job. If I just get this job, I'm up for promotion. I'm up for promotion. If I just get this position, if I just get this role, if I just get promoted, then I'm finally going to make it. I'm finally going to be there. I'm finally going to hit the mark. If I just get this much money, if I just get this much money, it's going to fulfill me. It's going to satisfy. If I just get this, when the kids quit, whenever they start sleeping through the end of the night, when they start sleeping all night, come on, somebody. Somebody's like, yes, Jesus. Yes. When they start sleeping all night long and I ain't got to change diapers or anymore, come on somebody someone's like you're preaching now <laughs> and I'm searching and I'm I'm looking for it in the job or the money or if I just get this many followers on Instagram once I get this many followers then I'll be satisfied then I'll be fulfilled and we're looking for life in dead places the searching of the soul because on the inside of each and every single one of us in the room you know that you were built for a reason that you were created on purpose for a purpose. You know that you were meant to make a difference. And this is the spirit of God that was breathed into man. And I know your situation doesn't reflect it. I know your childhood doesn't re represent that. But something on the inside of you is begging you to find it. But humanity says you'll find it in this. You'll find it in that. You'll find it I know what you're looking for. Let me tell you this, friends. It's the purpose in which you were sent into the world. And only, and only the creator can give its creation its purpose. Only God can do that. And so thus we enter the, into the gospel. The gospel simply translates into good news. And in order to have good news, you have to have bad news. And so here's the story. If you've never heard this story, and if you have, let me just refresh your memory just for a few moments. The story is this, is God created the heavens and the earth. And then God created Adam and Eve, and he placed them in the garden of Eden. And then what happens is the Bible says that they would walk, they would walk with God, they would talk with God. They were in complete connection with the creator of the universe. But what he does is he puts a tree in the middle of the garden and God says, you can have everything except for this. And I think about this all the time. Why in the world would God have done this? Come on, have you ever experienced something so bad and you're like, why did sin have to enter the world? Why did, why did bad things, why did all of it, why does it have to be here? Why do we have to be in this situation and go through these struggles? Why do I have to feel this depression? Why do I have to feel these suicidal thoughts? Why do I have to go through this and deal with this? And why, 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 why? Have you ever just wondered why God would put a tree in the garden? 
and I think about it, it's because it could not be true love unless they had a choice. It would have been forced love. If they had nothing else to choose and they only had God, it would be forced love. And for you, if you're forced to be with somebody and you have no other, you can't do it, like it, then it's not true love, it's forced love. And so God wanted to give us what's called free will. He wanted to give us a choice. Thus, he puts a tree in the garden, says you can have everything but this. And then they had the power to choose. Have you ever, come on parents, have you ever like um, told your kids you can eat all of this, but you can't eat this one? And have you ever just like walked out of the room and you come back and they eat the thing that you told them not to eat? <laughs> because we're all, <laughs> it's in our nature to, to want the things in which we're told we can't have. And so Adam and Eve, their curiosity of the unknown drew them to disobey. And in this moment, sin entered the world, causing this gap between humanity and its creator. And since our soul has been desperately searching to find its way back home in God. The Bible teaches us that the payment of sin is death. That means you and I, because of the sin, because of the, the bad in our life, the Bible says that the payment is death. And so if you read the Old Testament, you see that this, this system was, was enacted, a system of, of atonement and sacrifice, that the blood of an animal is to be shed for the payment of sin of the humanity. But if you know anything about this story, you know that it was just a temporary solution. To a permanent problem. It would never completely cover our sin. And so what happens is Jesus in this moment sees that, that nothing, else will, nothing else will suffice. No other sacrifice. And Jesus knows that in this moment he's like, no, send me in, I'll go. Jesus says, I'll go and I'll pay, I'll pay the price. I'll be the ransom. Come on, Jesus Christ said this. I'll be the final sacrifice once and for all. And then we see that, that he dove off of the balcony of heaven. Humanity like, like coming down to you and I. Divinity, God wrapped in humanity. He would come down, Jesus, the son of God, born of a virgin named Mary. And then at 30 years old, he would start his public ministry. He would start teaching and preaching the kingdom of God. And... The religious didn't understand it. The religious people of the day, the Pharisees, the teachers of the law, they didn't understand who Jesus really was. They didn't understand that Jesus is not religion. Because religion is this. It is man's attempt to work their way to God. I've got to do this, and I've got to get this right, and I've got to, get all, like, I've got to do all these things, and then I can work my way. Then God will actually love me. That's religion. And they didn't understand that God is not religion, but rather God is a relationship. That the God of the universe would come down and, and give his life for us. It is a relationship. It's God coming to us. Why do you think we resonate with hero stories so much? Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman, come on somebody. It's because it is the story of God. The creator and sustainer of the heavens and the earth coming to us. The Bible says it is by grace through faith in which you are saved. That means... That means there is nothing you could do to earn salvation. There's not enough Hail Marys you can say. There's not enough penance you can do. There's nothing you can do to earn salvation. It is the unmerited favor of God that gave us this gift. And so Jesus, without fault, he was arrested. He was tried. He was convicted, and he was sentenced to death. Like a lamb to the slaughter, the Bible says, he went to the cross, and his blood was shed, and Jesus died the death we deserve so we could live the life he deserved. And so now back to the text. 
these women, they go to the tomb and they're looking for Jesus and they did not find him there. You see, because after he had died on that cross, after he was crucified, a Roman execution, the worst kind of death, he was beaten, he was whipped, he was everything that you could imagine. Like the Bible says, like his bidget, his look, his, his, it was, it was beaten beyond mar, meaning, meaning he was, he was, you couldn't even recognize who he was. And he would go to the cross for us paying the penalty for you and I and they go looking for him and they can't find him and after he died on the cross the Bible says that he would go down into the grave that he would go into the depths of Hades and in this moment the devil thought he had won the devil thought he had conquered the God of the universe But what the devil didn't know is that Jesus was like a Trojan horse planted in hell for you and I. And he would go down there. Come on, somebody. I think about that. I thought about it this day. My, I got a guy, a guy's small group, and I and I, I thought I was trying to, say, I was gonna send him something. And on Sunday, sometimes they'll send something about Gladiator, and I'm like, oh, it's gonna be a day. And I was trying to think what I was gonna send this morning, and I saw that I, I thought about 300. And there's a part in there where, um, where uh, I don't even remember that guy's name, Gerard Butler, but that's not his Spartan name. Anyway, huh, what was that guy's name? Leonidas. I am King Leonidas, you know. <laughs> I just don't have the abs. <laughs> Too much candy. All right. <laughs> I thought about this. I thought about that part where he says, tonight we will dine in hell. And I think that's what Jesus said. For tonight I'll dine in hell. And he went to hell, and what did he do? He took what the enemy stole. He took the keys back for the kingdom of God. Come on, come on. He went down there, and when the devil thought he had killed him and defeated death, come on, he defeated hell, death, and the grave. Come on, somebody. This is the gospel. And he goes down there and and he takes it back. And so I believe the angel was there to tell these women, why are you looking among the dead for the living? Because they know life is not found in dead places. And this is the gospel. This is the good news. Jesus Christ has risen. And I'm not here today to condemn your search for purpose but rather to tell you that if you're anything like me, I was dead on the inside. I was numb on the inside and I was searching in all the wrong places. I come from three generations of pastors. My great grandfather, my grandfather, and my dad. The last thing I ever wanted to do was tell anybody about Jesus because I had only seen the side of the like God that was mad and angry. And I thought I was going to find fulfillment in other things and in other places and other spaces. At the end of everything else, let me just tell you. I was more empty. Than I could ever imagine. And I had this moment where I met Jesus. I really met Jesus. I gave everything up. I gave a career with benefits, health care. Every, I mean, everything. I said, God, I will tell people about this Jesus. I just want to say, why are you looking among the dead for the living? The Apostle Paul told the church in Corinth, he said this, 1 Corinthians 5.20. He said, Christ has been raised from the dead. So he is the first of a great harvest of all who have died. You and I, when we're born, we are born spiritually dead, disconnected from God. He is the first of a great harvest of all who have died. So you see, just as death came into the world through one man, this being Adam, now resurrection from the dead has begun through another man, Jesus Christ. The gospel is this, that Jesus did not come to make bad people good, but rather to rather to make dead people alive like us. Someone was like, Eli, where's your three points in a poem? 
I think there's no greater message than the gospel. For it is the gospel that has the power to save. And so if you need a point, there's a, this is it. This is the only, what I wrote down. Like, here it is. When I'm looking, when you're looking to fill the void in dead places, may you remember the gospel and look unto Jesus. I remember growing up, we would go to my grandparents' church and there's an old Methodist church. It's over there by Cameron, Hunting Horse United Methodist Church. And some of y'all, y'all are going to have no idea what this is, but this is called the hymnal. Come on, somebody. Come on, anybody remember a good old hymnal? Come on, turn to page 207. <laughs> it was in, they used to put them in the backs of what's called pews. Anybody ever seen a pew? Come on, most uncomfortable things in the world. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Jesus could have made some cushions for them things. I remember we would go, Moats Easter's growing up, to my grandparents' church. And, and I always loved the things of, of church, like the, like, like the nostalgic like things of it. And I remember there was this old hymn that we used to always sing, especially on Easter. And... Um, I heard this story about this old hymn, the story behind the hymn, and I thought it fitting to share it with you today. And the story is this. It was in the early 1900s. There's this old hymn, and it, it goes like this. I have decided to follow Jesus. And what happened in this story, true story, is there's this man, his wife and his two kids, they hear the message of Jesus. They had been searching and looking for life, and they couldn't find it in anything else. But they hear from some missionaries about this man named Jesus. And so this man gives his life to Christ. It's a, it's, he's like from this village in the hills of India. And the tribe was a violent tribe, and, and the chief hears about it, and the chief gets mad. The chief gets angry, so he calls this, this, this town meeting. And so the chief brings this family, this man, his wife, and his two kids, and he, he brings them there in the middle of this, and he has kind of this, kind of this like court setting. And the chief tells this man, I hear that you, 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 you found this Jesus. Well, our people, we don't believe in anything else but, but this. And the man said, no. He said, I've been looking. I've been searching. He said, I finally found it. His name is Jesus Christ. The savior of the world. The chief gets so angry. He gets so mad. The chief tells the man, he says, you must denounce this Jesus. He said, or I'm going to kill your two sons. And the man looks at his two sons. He looks back at the chief. And the man says, I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. The chief has the two boys executed right there in the middle of the town. The chief looks at the man, says, I'm going to give you another chance. He said, denounce this Jesus or I'm going to kill your wife. And the man looked at his wife. He said, though none go with me, still I will follow. No turning back. turning back the chief has the wife executed 
The chief is furious. He's angry. He doesn't know what to make of this. And he tells the man, this is your last chance. This is it. If you don't denounce this Jesus, I'm going to kill you. And the man said these words. The cross in front of me, the world behind me, no turning back. before me, the world behind me, no turning back, no, no turning, turning back. The chief has the man killed. And in this moment, the tribe, the village, and the chief, they're so moved at what they see. They're so impacted that this man, he, he, he find, he, he, they see somebody that have found something that they were willing to give their life for. The story goes is that many people in that village, in that moment, they drop to their knees. And the chief drops to his knees. And they say, they all say, I have decided to follow Jesus. Because they finally see somebody that was willing to give everything for something they had found. They had been searching and searching and searching and looking, and revival breaks out. And today, we still sing that hymn today. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. Though none go with me, I still will follow. I have decided to follow Jesus. The cross in front of me, the world behind me. I have decided to follow Jesus. Let's stand up and let's sing this hymn together. Come on, church. John 12 says this. That if a grain falls to the ground and dies, it will produce a harvest. In this village, the family died, but it produced a great harvest. It's the same thing with Jesus Christ. He, he died, and today it produces a good harvest. I just want to tell you this, if you've been searching and you've been looking, you've been trying to find like life in dead places, it is not found there. It's only found in Jesus. Romans 10, 9 says this, if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Come on, I got a PSA, a public service announcement. Stop searching. Stop looking. The thing you've been looking for life, it's only found in Jesus Christ. Come on, somebody. Today, friend, if you're in the room and you say, I want this Jesus, I'm willing to give my life to this Jesus, I want us to say this prayer together. I want you to confess it with your mouth. Believe it in your heart. Make Jesus the Lord of your life. It is the greatest decision you could ever make in your life. Church, let's pray this prayer together. Come on, we're family. Dear Heavenly Father, 
Jesus, today I choose you. Forgive me of my sin. Wash me clean. Make me new. Today, Jesus, I decide to follow you. In Jesus' name, come on, church, let's make some noise. Let's celebrate.